Hi, I'm Peter J. Ray. Welcome to Adventures in History. Today's topic is the 1950 Cleveland Buckeyes Negro American League Baseball season. This was the final year of Negro League Baseball in Cleveland, the last of 20 years. Going back to the 1922 Cleveland State's Tate Stars, followed by the Cleveland Browns, the Elites, Hornets, Tigers, Cubs, Stars, Giants, Red Sox, Bears, and eight, eight seasons of the Cleveland Buckeyes. They returned from, after a year in, in Louisville to have one final season in, in Cleveland. And uh, again, the Buckeyes were playing in the Negro American League. The Negro National League had folded. And home games at, in Cleveland were played at League Park on the east side. The, uh, the Buckeyes had a very tough year in 1950. They finished in fifth place in the Negro American League East. There were two divisions. Uh, their record was 3-39, and winning percentage of 071. The first place team was the Indianapolis Clowns, who were 47-38, and winning percentage of 553. Second place, the Baltimore Elite Giants, 24-20. Third place, the New York Cubans, 18 and 16. Fourth place, the Philadelphia Stars, 15 and 28. And in fifth and last place, the Cleveland Buckeyes, who were 3 and 39. In the Negro American League West, the Kansas City Monarchs were finished in first with a record of 55 and 21, winning percentage of 712. Second place, the Birmingham Black Barons. Third place, the Memphis Red Sox, 42 and 32. Fourth place, the Houston Eagles, 23 and 41. And in fifth and last place, the Chicago American Giants, 15 and 31. Where have you gone, Rube Foster? James S. Hirsch, a Willie Mays biographer, wrote, quote, The black game placed greater emphasis on speed, creativity, and daring, for it was designed to expl explicitly entertain fans at a time when organized entertainment was limited. The Negro League games featured a range of performers such as tap dancers, jugglers, vocalists, and bands, and the players themselves were part of the show. In 1950, and the, Negro, the Negro Leagues were dying, and there was less interest in winning games and more interest in producing ball players that, they could, that the teams could sell to MLB teams for 5000 hopefully big stars for $5,000. And they, teams were letting go of good older players and they, because they, they, they were not desirable to, in terms of selling to MLB. And they, were, they kept unproven, unfinished young players. Now, the Kansas City Monarchs sold Elston Howard to the New York Yankees. Cool Papa Bell, tremendous uh, Negro League star, uh, found Ernie Banks and uh, helped, uh, and he worked with Buck O'Neill to to get uh, Ernie Banks sold by the Kansas City Monarchs to the Chicago Cubs. And Buck O'Neill was involved in that. And Buck O'Neill also uh, signed, uh, signed Lou Brock, Lee Smith, and Joe Carter. Uh, who all, all, all those guys had tremendous seasons. 1954, now, since this, we're going to talk a little bit about the, uh, the end of the Negro Leagues. In 1954, the highest paid player for the Kansas City Monarchs was was a woman, Tony Stone. And you see, they, they brought in some women to play to try to do something about the attendance. By 1955, there were only four teams left in the Negro American League. The Kansas City Monarchs lasted until 1964. Regarding the end of, of the Negro Leagues, Buck O'Neill said, quote, I have a bittersweet feeling because I remember that a lot of people lost their whole way of life. Not only did a black business die, other black businesses did too, the ones that were dependent on black baseball. O'Neill, Buck O'Neill became a scout for the Chicago Cubs. He also signed Oscar Gamble, who became a tremendous player for the tribe in the 70s. He found him at playing in a semi-pro baseball game in rural Alabama and signed him for the Cubs. Uh, as I said, he signed uh, Lou Brock as well. Uh, one of uh, Lou Brock's sons had the middle, got the middle name of O'Neill, named after Buck O'Neill. And uh, Buck O'Neill became a Cubs coach in 1962, the first black MLB coach. Of course, later, Frank Robinson, became, for the Cleveland Indians, became the first black MLB manager. From 1949 to 1962, 11 of the 14 National League MVPs were black players. <laughs> As I said, he signed Joe Carter, who became a tremendous star for the Tribe back in the 80s. He signed him for the Cubs. And, of course, Joe Carter hit 1993 World Series, had 
at the World Series winning home run. It was only the second time it happened in, in MLB history. And the, the other time was Bill Mazeroski uh, for, the, for the Pirates in 1960. Buck O'Neill said, quote, The newfound popularity of the Negro Leagues has come along too late to save the Kansas City Monarchs, but it's gratifying nonetheless. It's wonderful that folks are remembering the people who built the bridge across the chasm of prejudice, not just the men who later crossed it. Effa Manley, and who's along with her husband Abe, who were who owned the Newark Eagles, became she became a, they became godparents of Larry Doby, who played for the Eagles and then for Cleveland, and uh, their first child, a Larry Doby Jr. Uh, that was uh, they were the godparents. Uh, in the 1970s, Effa Manley helped get a Los Angeles, California park named Chet Brewer Field. Chet Brewer had played for the Cleveland Buckeyes for three years. And Brewer was help, at the time was helping to run a boys' baseball program in that park. Quincy Troop, who played for, she, she moved to California, moved to Southern California. Quincy Troop, who played for, was a star for the Cleveland Buckeyes, visited Effa Manley in her old age. And... <coughs> Troop opened a senior citizen's home in Los Angeles. And uh, he also worked as a St. Louis Cardinals scout for 10 years. Now, the baseball hall, there was pressure as the uh, when the Negro Leagues uh, came to an end. There was a pressure that uh, Negro League players, even though they hadn't played MLB baseball or hadn't played very much, uh, they should be inducted into the Baseball Hall of Fame for their achievements in the Negro Leagues. And Satchel Paige was the first to be inducted in 1971. And then Josh Gibson and Josh Gibson and Buck Leonard were inducted in 1972. Now, previously, Jackie Robinson had been inducted in the Hall of Fame in 1962, primarily for his achievements in MLB. He had a year playing for the Kansas City Monarchs, and Roy Campanella in 1969 as well. He had a pretty good Negro League career, and but he was inducted primarily again for his his achievements in MLB. So there's pressure for, for more, more players to, to be from the Negro Leagues to be inducted. Monty Irvin was inducted in 1973, Cool Papa Bell in 1974, Judy Johnson in 1975, Oscar Charleston in 1976, and Martin DeHigo, and John Henry Popoloid in 1977. And so they, the folks thought, okay, that's the end of Negro League players in, in the Hall of Fame. 1977, Effa Manley wrote a letter to MLB Commissioner Bowie Kuhn saying that there were not enough Negro League players in the Hall of Fame, especially uh, Rube Foster, who's the f- father of Negro League baseball. 1980, Effa uh, Manley moved into Qu- Quincy Troop's rest home, and she died there in 1981 at age 80. She's buried in Culver City, California. On her tombstone are the words, she loved baseball. So eventually there was a Blue Ribbon Committee formed to, to, to induct more Negro League uh, players and personalities. And Rube Foster was inducted into the Hall of Fame in 1981. 1987, Ray Dandridge as well. And then, a, and then in 2006, a large number were inducted to try to finally rectify uh, this uh, wrongdoing, including seven players from the Negro Leagues who never played MLB, including Ray Brown, Willard Brown, Andy Cooper, Biz Mackey, Louis Santop, Mules Suttles, and Judd Wilson. Along with those fellas, five pre-Negro League players, were in, before the Negro Leagues had been established, were also inducted, including Frank Grant, Pete Hill, Joe Mendez, Ben Taylor, and Cristobal Tor- Torriente, as well executives Sol White. Of course, Sol White had a pretty good playing career himself. Come Posey, who was the owner of the uh, Homestead Homestead Grays, Alex Pompez, J. L. Wilkinson, owner of the Kansas City Monarchs, and Effa Manley, who was the first woman inducted into the Hall of Fame. So far, the only woman. 1949, the Negro American League East champions, the Baltimore Elite Giants, defeated the Negro American League West champions, the Chicago American Giants, in the championship series. Now, in 1950, the the champions of the Negro Leagues were the Indianapolis Clowns. 
And they repeated in 1951 and 1952 for three straight years. The Indianapolis Clowns were champions. 1953, it was the Kansas City Monarchs. 1954, the Indianapolis Clowns again. 1955, the Kansas City Monarchs again. 1956, the Detroit Stars. And in 1957, the Kansas City Monarchs, who I believe were the last uh, listed Negro League champion. Now, Ray Dandridge, who was a tremendous star, played for the, in the minor leagues for the Minneapolis Millers. He reported his age as being 29, but he was actually 36. And his first year in the, for the Millers, he hit 364. And uh, he, he, was the, uh, ne- he was the second in voting for R- Rookie of the Year. The next year, he was MVP in the minor leagues. He was never called up by the Giants. That was really tragic. Luke Easter... I became a star for the San Diego Padres, and, and they're in the Pacific Coast League. There were record crowds coming to see his tape measure home runs, and then he became a star for the Cleveland Indians. Of course, Satchel Page continued to play. Uh, he played for Cleveland in, in MLB, but then and then again back in the minors for in the Mondock League in Canada. And there was a game. A teammate asked Page, "This was would be in the '50s during the national anthem, why he hadn't warmed up." And Page said, "Quote: I've been warmed up since 1936." The Chicago American Giants hired a white clown, Ed Heyman, as a part of their entertainment. But when they were in Birmingham, under Jim Crow law, he was ordered off the field because, they, because of the segregation laws where blacks and whites could not be together. And Heyman later owned the Indianapolis clowns himself. The Washington Homestead Grays folded in 1951. 1951 East-West All-Star Game attendance was, was down 21312 or 14161 paid. 1952, the Negro League World Series, the Indianapolis Clowns defeated the Bir- Birmingham Black Barons in 12 games. The Clowns won seven games, and it was a wandering southern barnstorm tour. They played all over those World Series games. The Clowns had a star. Indianapolis Clowns had a star, Hank Aaron, who was 18. And uh, in 1952, he left the team. In June, he was signed by the Boston Braves, went to their minor leagues. However, he returned to play in the 1952 Negro League World Series. And, of course, Hank Aaron became the home run king with 755 home runs. The 1952 East-West All-Star Game, the attendance continued to decline, 18,127, or 14,122 paid fans. 1953 was the last Negro League superstar, well, one of them, who to go to MLB, Ernie Banks, who went from the Kansas City Monarchs to the Chicago Cubs. 1953, there was a woman player, Marcinia Stone, for the Indianapolis Clowns, paid $12,000. She played in 50 games and hit 243, but then later was sold to the Kansas City Monarchs. Then the Clowns added two, two more women, uh, Connie Morgan and Mamie Peanut Johnson. By 1953, the Negro American League only had four teams as Kansas City Monarchs, Birmingham Black Barons, Indianapolis Clowns, and the Memphis Red Sox. The 1953 uh, East-West All-Star Game, there were estimated 5,000 to 10,000 fans, so attendance continued to decline. The last East-West All-Star Game was played at Yankee Stadium in 1961. Going back to 1954, two teams were added to the Detroit Stars and the Louisville Clippers. Lawrence D. Hogan wrote, quote, The march toward oblivion continued in 1955. Ralph Specks Bebop was a midget and played for the Indianapolis Clowns from 1950 to 1960. 1958, the Detroit Stars owner was Goose Tatum, who was a star basketball player for the Harlem Globetrotters. In the 1961 East-West All-Star Game, Satchel Paige was uh, pitched three innings at age 55, was the winning pitcher, helping the West win that game 7-1. to one. There were only 7,245 fans at Yankee Stadium. 19, by 1963, black players were common and dominant in MLB, and 15%, uh, 15% of, of MLB players were black, black American or black Latin. From 1947 to 1963, there were all a very large number of numbers of MVPs in the National League, including Jackie Robinson, Roy Campanella three times, Willie Mays, Don Newcomb, Hank Aaron, Ernie Banks twice, Frank Robinson, and Maury Wills. Now, the National League Rookies of the Year Jackie included Jackie Robinson in 1947, 
Don Newcomb in 1949, Sam Jethro in 1950, Willie Mays in 1951, Joe Black 1952, Jim Gillum 1953, Frank Robinson 1956, Orlando Cepeda 1958, Willie McCovey 1959, and, B- and Billy Williams 1961. In 1963, four of the top uh, players in batting average uh, were, were, at, were black Americans, and, uh, and as well as ho- RBIs and home runs. And the top five guys in stolen bases were all black. Jackie Robinson, the can- now the play- Jackie Robinson, the can- who played for the Kansas City Monarchs, Roy Campanella for the Baltimore Elite Giants, Willie Mays played for the Birmingham Black Barons. Don Newcomb played for the Newark Eagles. Hank Aaron for the Indianapolis Clowns. Ernie Banks for the Kansas City Monarchs. Sam Jethro for the Cleveland Buckeyes. And Joe Black for the Baltimore Elite Giants. Now, now MLB changed as a result of black players uh, uh, entering MLB because they, they, they added speed to the base pass. Willie Mays... Frank Aaron and Frank Robinson both had speed and power. By the mid-1960s, all, Neg- all the Negro League teams had folded except for the Indianapolis Clowns, who continued to operate and play until 1988. 59 years, the longest tenure of a Negro League team. Uh, so one of the things that teams were doing was shadow ball, infield practice without a ball. One of the players for the Clowns was a player named King Tut. Uh, took the name King Tut. They were kind of like the Harlem Globetrotters in sports and humor. The last years of the, for the Clowns, 70% of the players were white. Very interesting. Jimmy Crutchfield, a Negro League player, said, quote, I have no ill feeling about never having had the opportunity to play in the big leagues. I can say I contributed something. Max Manning said, quote, The Negro Leagues were really Negro Major Leagues. Look what the early players who entered the major leagues did. They were all big stars. I have absolutely no regrets, none whatsoever, in terms of what happened to me. I think destiny plays a big part in what happens in people's lives. I'm just so happy I had the experience. Mark Rabowski wrote, quote, There was hectic shuffling from black ball to lower level white ball, common across the Negro League map in the late 40s. Again, Ray Dandridge was a star in the minors, a big star in the in Negro League, star in the minors, but never was called up by the Minnesota Twins. And years later, or by the New York Giants, years later, he's very angry at New York Giants owner Horace Stoneman, and he, they met, and he said, quote, You had the chance to sell my contract. You had the chance to bring me up, and you wouldn't do it. You could have called me up for one week. I could have said I, I hit in the major leagues. Kansas City Monarchs sold Ernie Banks to the Cubs for $20,000. 1957, Mark Rabowski wrote about the Negro League Commissioner J.B. Martin, quote, while Martin waited for MLB Commissioner Ford Frick to subsidize his circuit for all of baseball to utilize, the league and the game withered and died. The last East-West All-Star game was in 1963 in Kansas City. Mark Rabowski wrote, quote, The final contest was attended by a few thousand fans, lured lured by curiosity or long memories. Again, after 1949, uh, after playing in Louisville, Kentucky in 1949, the Buckeyes returned to Cleveland in 1950, and they had a very, uh, very, very poor record of 3 and 39. Attendance was very low, and the team folded on, on July 6, and this was the end of Negro League Baseball in Cleveland, and the end of professional baseball at League Park in Cleveland. The average attendance in 1950 for Buckeyes games was 1,200 per game. Again, 1950, uh, Sam Jethro, the former Cleveland Buckeyes star, was playing in MLB for the Boston Braves and was Rookie of the Year at age 33, the oldest Rookie of the Year ever. Jethro integrated the Boston Braves and the Pittsburgh Pirates. And in in later years, he worked to have pensions for Negro League t- uh, play- guys who played in the Negro Leagues. And by 1997, MLB agreed to pay uh, ne- Negro League guys who never played MLB baseball. Now, the uh, manager for the Buckeyes in 1950 was Alonzo Boone. 
Boone played for the Cleveland Cubs in 1931, the Cleveland Bears from 1939 to 1940, the Cincinnati Cleveland Buckeyes in 1942, and the Cleveland Buckeyes in 1943, from 1945 to 1948, and in 1950. Alonzo Boone. Now, there are very, there's almost, there's very, almost no statistics for the 1950 Cleveland Buckeyes. Uh, Otha Bailey was the catcher. They called him Bill. He played for the Birmingham Black Barons, Chattanooga Choo Choo's, Cleveland Buckeyes, Houston Eagles, and New Orleans Eagles from 1950 to 1951. He was a scrappy little catcher with an accurate arm and quick behind the plate. He, he stole, he didn't steal bases. He was a line drive hitter without much power. With the Birmingham Black, he was with the Birmingham Black Barons from 1952 till the end of the decade. He was also a teammate with Charlie Pride, who became a country music star. Later, uh, Bailey was a scout. He's a scout for the Boston Red Sox. In 1959, he got a regular job with Connor Steele in Birmingham, Alabama. And he was born in 1930 in Huntsville, Alabama. Otha Bailey. Marvin Price played first base. Price played for the Chicago American Giants, the Cleveland Buckeyes, and the Newark Eagles between 1950 and 1952, and he hit 296 in 1950. Marvin Price. Marvin Williams played second base. They called him Tex or Coquetta. During his career, he played second base, third base, first base, and outfield. He played for the Philadelphia Stars in Mexico for Mexico City, the Mexico City Reds and Chihuahua in Venezuela for Vargas and the Cleveland Buckeyes, then in the, in the minor leagues for the for Sacramento in the Pacific Coast League and Vancouver, also Tulsa from 1943 to 1961. He was a good hitter with power. In the 1944 Negro League t- season, he hit three, 338 for Philadelphia and was an all-star. In 1945, he hit 393 for Philadelphia, and, and then 362 in Mexico City. He was a Mexican all-star three years. And, and then in Chihuahua, 1952, he won a batting title in Mexico, batting 401. In Vancouver, in 1954, he hit 366. He led the American League in home runs with 45 and 131 RBIs in 1954. Never made it to MLB. Williams was born in 1920 in Haslam, Texas, and died in 2000 in, in, Con- in Conroe, Texas, at age 80. For his Negro League career, he batted 360 with 122 hits, 68 runs, 22 doubles, 9 triples, 7 home runs, 78 RBIs, 5 stolen bases, 25 walks, and 86 games. In the minor leagues, he batted 316 with 965 hits, 269 runs scored, 186 doubles, 44 triples, 148 home runs, 318 RBIs, 9 stolen bases, 229 walks in 1,066 games over 11 seasons. What a fine minor league career for Marvin Williams. Charles Harvey played shortstop. Harvey was with the Cleveland Buckeyes in 1950 and hit 286. Charles Harvey. Wiley Griggs played third base. They called him Willie and Diamond Jim and also Robert. He played third base and second base in his career. He played for the Birmingham Black Barons, Cleveland Buckeyes, Houston Eagles, and New Orleans Eagles from 1948 to 1951. He was born in 1925 in Birmingham, Alabama. In 1948, he won a Negro League title with Birmingham. After he retired, he worked for the Birmingham Waterworks for 28 years. In later years, he lost both legs, but he learned to cope with life, cope with life as a double amputee. He was born in 1925 in Union Springs, Alabama, and died in 1996 in Birmingham, Alabama at age 71. For his career, he batted 154 with two hits and 13 at-bats, four runs, a a double, three walks, and eight games. Very incomplete statistics for Wiley Griggs. Joseph Caffey played left field. They called him Clifford and Joe. He played for the Cleveland Buckeyes and in the minor leagues for for Duluth in the Northern League and Buffalo in the International League and the Cleveland Indians from 1950 to 1958. He was born in 1931 in Raymer, Alabama, and died in 2011 in Warren, Ohio at age 80. For his career in Negro Leagues, he hit 203, he hit 203 in 1950 uh, for the Buckeyes, and he was age he was 19. He had an 11-year career. The minor leagues and uh, his minor league and MLB career averages were both 291. He was a free swinger. In Duluth, in 1952, he led the league in six categories at bats, hits, triples, total bases, and average. In Indianapolis, for Indianapolis, in the American Association, 
1956, he played for the Cleveland Indians and hit 342 in 12 games. 1957, with Buffalo, he led the league hitting 330. The 1957 Tribe, he hit 270 with three home runs and in 89 at bats. He's with the Cleveland Indians in 1956 and 57. Played 44 games for the Tribe. They called him Rabbit. In the minor leagues, he played for the Buffalo Bisons, Charlotte Hornets, Duluth Dukes, Harrisburg Senators, Indianapolis Indians, Miami Marlins, Montreal Royals, San Diego Padres, St. Paul Saints, and the Syracuse Chiefs, as well as the Wilson, Wilson Tobbs. In the MLB, he batted 291 with 37 hits. He scored 21 runs, 2 doubles, 13 triples, 3 home runs, 11 RBIs, 3 stolen bases, 8 walks in 44 games. In the minor leagues, he batted 295 with 1,278 hits, 461 runs scored, 222 doubles, 66 triples, 76 home runs, 273 RBIs, 93 stolen bases, 286 walks in 1,265 games. What a tremendous career for Joe Caffey. Frank Evans played some played center field. He, he, during his career, he was an outfielder, first baseman, pitcher, and catcher. Played for the Cleveland Buckeyes in the minor leagues for Brandon and Winnipeg in the Mondock League from 1949 to 1950. He was born in 1921. In 1951, he played and managed several black teams, and which continued for another decade. For a quarter century, he was affiliated with ball clubs as an instructor, scout, and coach. Frank Evans. Willie Grace played some outfield. Grace... Grace Played for the Cincinnati Cleveland Buckeyes in 1942, the Cleveland Buckeyes from 1943 to 1948, and in 1950. So this was the end of his time in Cleveland. He continued in the minor leagues until 1951. Willie Grace. Leonard Pig was a spare catcher. They called him Fatty and Shine. He was in the U.S. Army from 1940 to 1945. He played for the Indianapolis Clowns, Cleveland Buckeyes, in the minor leagues in Canada for Brandon in the White Sox organization from 1947 to 1954. He was a good hitting catcher with a fair arm. He lacked mobility behind the plate and was slow on the bases. He played in the baseball sandlots in Lawton, Oklahoma. In the Second World War, he saw, he, 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 he saw nine months of combat in the Philippines in Southeast Asia. In Cuba, he played for Havana and La Palomas. He was played for the Clown, Indianapolis Clowns in 1948. In 1949, he hit 345. And then after he retired, he lived in Seattle, Washington, and worked in the construction business. And he was born in 1919 in Grant, Oklahoma, and died in 1993 in Seattle, Washington, at age 73. Leonard Pig. Charles Murray was a, was a catcher. And Murray was with the Louisville Buckeyes in 1949 and the Cleveland Buckeyes in 1950. Charles Murray. Kenneth Carter was another catcher, and Carter was with the Cleveland Buckeyes in 1950. Curtis Pitts was a catcher. He also played some shortstop. He was with the Cleveland Buckeyes and the Chicago American Giants from 1950 to 1951. And he, was the re- he was a regular catcher and hit 175 in 1950. Curtis Pitts. You can see they're bringing in a lot of players for uh, basically tryouts, trying to find players that they could sell to MLB. Eddie Jamison was another catcher, and he was with the Cleveland Buckeyes in 1950. Lorenzo Marsh was another catcher. He was with the Cleveland Buckeyes in 1950 and played in less than 10 games. Lorenzo Marsh. Clarence Winder was a catcher with the Cleveland Buckeyes in 1950. Clarence Winder. Earl Suttles played some first base, was with the Cleveland Buckeyes in 1950, and batted 174 in 10 games. Earl Suttles. Pablo Bernard played some second base and shortstop. He was with the Cleveland Buckeyes and in the minor leagues the Louisville Buckeyes, the Cleveland Buckeyes, in the minor leagues for Ventura in the California League, for Denver in the Western League, for Billings in the Pioneer League, and Tulsa in the Texas League, also Havana in the International League, and Austin. In Billings, he hit 334 with 40 stolen bases. In Mexico, in, for Nuevo Laredo, he, in 1958, he led the league with a 371 average, 182 hits, and 106 runs scored. He also played in Panama. He was a light-hitting middle infielder. His most, most of his career was spent in the minor leagues, 12 years. His career was from 1949 to 1961. Pablo Bernard. Charles Johnson played some second base and third base. He played for the Memphis Red Sox and Cleveland Buckeyes from 1949 to 1950. 
1949 with Memphis, he hit 333 in limited playing time. 1950, he hit 256 for the Buckeyes. Charles Johnson. Doc Hardy played some second place for the Cleveland Buckeyes in 1950. Doc Hardy. Joe Trawick played some second base for the Cleveland Buckeyes in 1950. Joe Trawick. Stuart Wilson played some shortstop and second base for the Cleveland Buckeyes in 1950 and hit 267. Stuart Williams. Dallas Jackson played some shortstop and second base for the Cleveland Buckeyes in 1950, and his playing time was restricted. Dallas Jackson. T.J. Brown played some third base. They called him Tom. He was a shortstop, third base, second baseman. He played for the Memphis Red Sox, Harrisburg, Harrisburg for, for the St. Louis Stars, the Cleveland Buckeyes, Indianapolis Clowns, and the Louisville Buckeyes in the minor leagues for Danville in the Mississippi-Ohio League. He was a hustler with wide range and a good arm. He was in the U.S. Army in 1946. In 1942 with Memphis, he hit 316 and played in the East-West All-Star team. And he married a bathing beauty queen, T.J. Brown. William Reynolds played some third base and second base. They called him Bill. Played for the Cleveland Buckeyes in 1948 and 1950. This was the end of his Negro League career. William Reynolds. Henry Presswood played some infield. He was with the Cleveland Buckeyes from 1948 to 1950. His Negro League career continued until 1952 with the Kansas City Blues. Henry Presswood. Charles Bruton played some third base and second base, and he played for the Cleveland, Buckeye, Cleveland Bears in 1939 and the Cleveland Buckeyes in 1950. This was the end of his Negro League career. Charles Bruton. Charles Jones played some third base. Jones played for the Cleveland Buckeyes in 1950. And in 1950, the Negro Leagues were, were struggling to survive because of a loss of players to the minor leagues in MLB. Charles Jones. Bob Young played some shortstop, second base, and third base for the Cleveland Buckeyes in 1950. Bob Young. Charles Ma Marvray played outfield and, and pitched. He's also played some outfield and first base. He was with the Louisville Buckeyes in 1949 and the Cleveland Buckeyes in 1950. And the, for the two years, he hit 278 and 288. Charles Marvray. Rudolph Johnson played some outfield. They called him Rudy. He played for the Cleveland Buckeyes in 1950. Rudolph Johnson. Curtis Livingston played some outfield for the Cleveland Buckeyes in 1950. Curtis Livingston. Johnny Bryant played some outfield for the Cleveland Buckeyes in 1950. Johnny Bryant. Wesley Calhoun played, played right field. He was, also, he was an infielder, outfielder, and played for the Cleveland Buckeyes in 1950. Wesley Calhoun. Samuel Brewster played some outfield for the Cleveland Buckeyes in 1950. He's a reserve outfield, outfielder, and his playing time was severely restricted. Samuel Brewster. Now, the pitching staff included George Jefferson, who was a pitcher and an outfielder. He played for the Cleveland Buckeyes from 1944 to 1948 and in 1950. In 1950, his record was 1-2 and two in five games, and he hit 298 playing the outfield. In the minor leagues, he also played for Youngstown. George Jefferson. Paul Jones was another pitcher. He played for the Louisville Buckeyes and the, the Cleveland Buc Buckeyes in, in the minor leagues for Elmwood in the Mondock League, also for Flint, Vancouver, and Winston-Salem from 1949 to 1950. His record in 1950 was 0-5 with an ERA of 8.10. For Flint in 1951, he was 3-19 with an ERA of 6.84. By 1958, he played for a Cleveland Buckeyes team that was not of major league quality. Paul, Paul Jones. William Scruggs uh, was another pitcher. They called him Willie. He played for the Birmingham Black Barons, the Louisville Buckeyes, the Cleveland Buckeyes, the Houston Eagles, and the New Orleans Eagles from 1949 to 1951. And in 1950, his record with Cleveland was 1-5. William Scruggs. Rayford Finch was another pitcher. Finch played for the Louisville Buckeyes, Cleveland Buckeyes, in the minor leagues for Elmwood and Winnipeg in the Mondock League. Also in, for Danville in the Mississippi-Ohio Valley League from 1949 to 1953. With Elmwood in 1951, he was 10-11. Rayford Finch. XL Moore was another pitcher. He played for the Cleveland Buckeyes, New Orleans Eagles, and Indianapolis Clowns between 1950 and 1952. In 1950, his record was 0-3 with an ERA of 10.13. XL Moore. Clyde Golden was another pitcher. 
Golden played for the Newark Eagles, Houston Eagles, Cleveland Buckeyes, New Orleans Eagles, and Chicago American Giants between 1948 and 1952. He was born in 1928 in Jackson, Florida. For his career, he was 2-4 with an ERA of 4.58, 14 games, 6 starts, 2 complete games, a shutout, 2 saves, 55 innings pitched, and 34 strikeouts. He batted 056 with 1 hit and 18 at-bats and had an RBI. Clyde Golden. Samuel Fawkes. Fawkes played for the Chicago American Giants, the Kansas City Monarchs, and the Cleveland Buckeyes from 1948 to 1950 and was from Lake Charles, Louisiana. Charles Fawkes. Sam Barber was another pitcher. He played for the Cleveland Buckeyes in 1942 and from 1946 to 1950. Sam Barber. Leonard Collier was another pitcher. He was with the Cleveland Buckeyes in 1950. His record was 0-7 with an ERA of 9.21. Leonard Collier's. Eugene Smith was another pitcher. Smith was with the Cleveland Buckeyes from 1947 to 1948. His Negro League baseball career continued until 1951. Eugene Smith. Clyde Williams was another pitcher. He was with the Cleveland Buckeyes from 1947 to 1950. This was the end of his Negro League career. Clyde Williams. John Thomas was with the Cleveland Buckeyes in 1950. He pitched in three games and had no decisions. John Thomas. Robert Cunningham was another pitcher. They called him Slim. He was with the Cleveland Buckeyes in 1950. His record was 0-2 in eight games. Robert Cunningham. Norris Stiles played for the Cleveland Buckeyes in 1950 and was a pitcher. Norris Stiles. Albert Ellis was another pitcher and was with the Cleveland Buckeyes in 1950. Albert Ellis. Artis Stewart uh, played for the Cleveland Buckeyes in 1950. Artis Stewart. Player named Flurney, no first name indicated, was with the Cleveland Buckeyes in 1950 and played in one game. Player named Flurney. Ernest Long was with the Cleveland Buckeyes in 1940 and 1950. He was a pitcher. This was the end of his Negro League baseball career. Ernest Long. Walter Kelly was another pitcher. He was with the Cleveland Buckeyes in 1950. Walter Kelly. Bob Mitchell was with was another pitcher who played for the Cleveland Buckeyes in 1950. His record was 0-1 in one game. Bob Mitchell. A player named Lyons was with the Cleveland Buckeyes in 1950. A player named Lyons. Robert Scruggs was another pitcher with Cle- the Cleveland Buckeyes in 1950. Robert Scruggs. Willie Turnstall was another player with the Cleveland Buckeyes in 1950. Willie Turnstall. Player named Wilson was another pitcher for the Cleveland Buckeyes in 1950. Player named Wilson. And finally, Thomas Russell was the, was the last of 60 players for the Buckeyes in 1950. He was a pitcher. He'd gotten one game and had no decisions in, in 1950. Thomas Russell. 1950, the Negro League champions were the Indianapolis Clowns. I read a fine book, Satch and Me by Dan Gutman, 2006. There's a story that Satchel Page, funny story, entered a game in relief. There were runners on first and third, and he, he snuck a second ball into the game. So he on the mound, he had two balls in his glove. He went into his windup, according to the story, and used the, he used the two balls at the same time to, throw, to pick off both runners on first and third. There was an 0-2 count on the hitter who swung, and got a, so he got a strikeout, and it was a triple play. So this is a really funny story. 1949, the Boston Red Sox, a Boston Red Sox scout, highly recommended that the uh, the team sign Willie Mays playing for Birmingham. But Joe Cronin, of the uh, GM of the Red Sox, was not interested in signing black players at that time. The Yankees also were not interested in sign, signing black players. John Klima wrote, quote, The 1949 East-West All-Star Game promised to be Negro baseball's last great used car sale. There were MLB scouts and MLB commissioner Chappie Chandler at the game, and eight of the players went to MLB who played in that All-Star game. Later, the Red Sox changed their mind and wanted to get to sign Willie Mays. However, they uh, released Piper Davis, who was a uh, Willie Mays mentor, and this, this angered Willie Mays, who didn't want to sign with Boston after that. 1950, the Birmingham Black Barons were in New York City, and their bus caught fire and was destroyed. Uh, Willie Mays and his teammates escaped, lucky to escape with their lives. However, uh, they lost their baseball equipment, uniforms, gloves, and bats in that fire in the Holland Tunnel in New York City. 
1950, the New York Giants bought Willie Mays from the Birmingham Black Barons. They paid $15,000, and $5,000 went to Willie Mays. Now, during these early, in the early 50s, there was an MLB unofficial quota, and uh, some uh, it was reportedly there were a maximum of five players per team. They were, they were limiting spaces on the teams. Black players were paid less, and white players were threatened because of there were all these really tremendous players and often abused black teammates. John Klima, Klima wrote, quote, when the world watched Willie Mays play baseball, they never knew they were watching the souls of the men he carried with him from the 1948 Birmingham Black Barons. 1950, Willie Mays was the Negro League was the Negro League's brightest star. They called him the Arm. The Birmingham World reported, "Quote: He is a sensation of throwing long balls that spell out." For the surprise base runner. He had the best throwing arm in the Negro Leagues in 1950. In 1950, four MLB teams had black players. The Brooklyn Dodgers, Cleveland Indians, New York Giants, and Boston Braves. Willie Mays was a free agent for three weeks between his high school graduation and then when he signed with the Giants. Bill Maughan wrote, quote, The teams which had signed Negro players felt they had enough for the time being, at least. Those who didn't have any were not interested at the time. Most of the scouts I told about Willie Mays were Southerners who would be inclined to look the other way. Henry Aaron biographer Howard Bryant wrote, quote, Jackie Robinson's signing was a transcendent day for America. For Henry, for Henry Aaron, after, baseball was transformed into an obsession. Jackie Robinson was in Mobile, Alabama in 1948 for an exhibition game. Hank Aaron was 14 and he saw Jackie Robinson and he, Aaron said, quote, I knew I was going to be a ball player. There was no doubt in my mind. 1952, Henry Aaron was playing for the Indianapolis Clowns at age 17. He was the last Negro League player to go to MLB and then eventually the Hall of Fame. It's, this was near the end of, these were the final years of Negro League baseball. Aaron only played in 14 games for the Clowns. He was sensational, and the MLB scouts were swarming. He batted 483 with five home runs and 24 RBIs in one month. June of 52, he signed with the Boston Braves. He played in the minors for the Eau Claire in, in Eau Claire, Wisconsin. 1953, Tony Stone signed with the Indianapolis Clowns. Female player, they're trying to raise attendance, and it really worked. Tennis went up. People came to see these uh, see female players in the Negro Leagues. 1954, she was sold to the Kansas City Monarchs, and then uh, they, uh, the Clowns signed Mamie Johnson and Connie Morgan for the Clowns. Stone, called, uh, Stone was called the female Jackie Robinson, and the Clowns won the title in 1954 with these two female players. Uh, Stone was not allowed to stay in the team hotel because it was they assumed that she was a prostitute. So she stayed in brothels and made and was befriended and, and received her support from prostitutes. Female fans were highly supportive of these three women who played Negro League baseball. So that's the story of the 1950 Cleveland Buckeyes. The this was the last Negro League season in Cleveland. The end of the and the Negro Leagues were dying and and MLB was changing very much for the better with these exciting, very talented black players. God bless the guys who played for the Cleveland Buckeyes in 1950 and everyone else associated with the team, including the fans, especially the First World War veterans, Second World War veterans, and Korean War veterans. Captains of the Cuyahoga, lovers of Lake Erie, Terminal Tower Power, fans of the Free Stamp statue and the Fountain of Eternal Life, Euclid Avenue Electricity, Severance Hall Stalwarts, Cleveland Museum of Art Enthusiasts, Rock and Roll Hall of Fame and Museum Rebels, Christmas Story House, Happy People, Museum of Contemporary Art, Maniacs, Cleveland Bot Botanical Garden, Goers, <coughs> Old Arcade Admirers, Playhouse Square Seers, Settlers Landing Park, Purists, Western Reserve, Historical Society, Wonders, First Energy Stadium, Friends, Progressive Field Pals, Rocket Mortgage Field House, Renegades, Cuyahoga Valley National Park, Pioneers, and Great Lakes Science Center supporters. Tribe, Browns, Cavs, Monsters, Gladiators, and Fusion rule. Cleveland, City of Champions. Cleveland is the best location in the nation on the north coast of America. New York is the Big Apple. Cleveland is a plum. Uh, we're having a great year. It's, we have a, our 71-year uh, title drought. It's, 
It's going to end this year. To quote, uh, going back to 1948, to quote uh, Tug McGraw, you got to believe. And to quote uh, Kevin, Kevin Garnett, anything is possible. So you might consider checking out our website, Adventures in History with Peter J. Ray at peterjray.com. Thank you so much for watching. I really appreciate it. God bless you. Take care. And I'll see you next time.